LivingMaths.com. LivingMaths. Living as a mathematics.com. All right. So we are live on the internet. We have our Dr. Don Thomas, who is a. You've frozen up here, Steve. Veteran, uh, he has many. What we're going to do is we're going to ask Dr. Thomas to tell us all about his journeys into space, and we're going to try and get the presentation working so that we can match exactly what it is that you want to tell us. Let's go like this to the beginning. We are ready. Okay, so Don, we're gonna let you we're gonna let you fire away. Okay, well good morning or good afternoon everybody. It's morning here in the United States. I want to wish everybody a happy space week here. And I know we've got uh, people listening in from all over the world here, from India, Kenya, South Africa, and maybe other countries. Just want to welcome all of you and, and hope you have a great Space Week. We've got a lot of exciting things going on up in space right now with the International Space Station and other projects. And what I'm going to do here this afternoon is tell you a little bit about my experiences in space. I had the amazing opportunity to fly on four space shuttle missions. I was on Space Shuttle Columbia three times and Space Shuttle Discovery once. And during my missions, my four flights, I spent a total of 44 days up in space, and I got to go around the Earth all the way around it 692 times. So I can see here pretty confidently say, I have seen your hometown, wherever you live. Okay, so if we could go with the ne next slide, Steve. Okay, we're going to see if we can get it working. Uh, let's go to share screen. And I'm going to be sharing screen so that the rest of the viewers around the world can see it as well. All they've got to do is just click on the actual uh, on on the picture. Yep. Are we set to go? Yep, we are. Okay. This picture you see now is not a picture of me, but it very well could have been me. I was a young boy, just five years old, uh, when the first American astronaut launched into space back in 1961. So it was 53 years ago. And at my school, they brought me to the gymnasium. We sat on the floor, and I watched a small black and white TV that day. And as soon as I watched the launch, I knew I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to go into space. I wanted to experience weightlessness. I wanted to see sunrises, sunsets with my own eyes. So I always knew what I wanted to do. Uh, it just took me a long time to get there. I worked hard in school, always tried to do my best in all my subjects in math, and science, and reading, and history, uh, all my classes, in music, I tried to do my best. And after uh, high school, I went on to uh, university and got, got my degree in physics, one of the sciences. And then I stayed on in university and got my advanced degrees in engineering. So I've got a master's degree and a doctorate in engineering. And I finally got out of college uh, university and started applying to NASA to become an astronaut. And it took me four tries before I made it into the program. The first time I applied, NASA said no. Two years later, they had another selection. I tried again, and they said no. And then three years later, another astronaut selection. I got turned down the third time, but I really wanted to do this bad, so I was taking flying lessons and learning how to skydive and to, to improve my background. And then finally, the fourth time I applied, I made it into the program. I was 35 years old when I first got selected by NASA, and then I was uh, 39 years old the first time I flew in space. And 39 years old for our students there today, learners, uh, that's pretty much an old man, right? But some of the careers you're going to pick, it's going to take a while for you to get there. So I encourage you all, just work hard in school, always do your best, and never give up on that dream of yours. My dream was to go in space. Many of you have dreams of what you want to do when you grow up, you know, get older and grow up and, and just keep working towards that dream. And finally, as I said, I got to uh, go on four space shuttle missions. The next picture will show you the proof of my last flight. 
The last time I flew in space was in uh, 1997, so it's been 17 years since I was in space. And this is the crew from my last mission. We typically would fly with a crew of seven astronauts. And our two, uh, we've got two military pilots there in the front row with, with the helmets. They help us fly the shuttle. On the left-hand side is Jim Halsell. He was our commander on the mission. And on the right-hand side with the helmet is Susan Still. And Susan's a pretty unique individual. She's only the second woman to pilot the space shuttle. And Susan was one of our country's top Navy fighter pilots. So it was a great opportunity for me to fly with her on this mission. And then in the background there, you see five science astronauts. They're called mission specialists and payload specialists. And our job is to deploy satellites. We work with robotic arm on the shuttle if there's a need for that. We uh, do the science experiments on board as well. You probably don't recognize that guy in the far right-hand side, but that's the way I used to look 17 years ago before glasses, gray hair, wrinkles, and a few pounds around the middle that you can't see here right now. Okay, next. Okay, so next slide. I think it's, let's see, we almost got it. Next slide, yes. And then you see the, the space shuttle, and I took this picture the night before my first mission. I went out there about midnight or so with another one of the astronauts, and it was so amazing just to stand there at the base of your space shuttle all lit up like that. And as I stood there gazing up at the shuttle, I had a lot of butterflies in my stomach. I was a little bit nervous, a little bit scared, but mainly really excited because I knew in 12 hours I'm going to be sitting inside that thing blasting off. And I almost couldn't believe where I was and what I was about to do. That big orange tank in the background there is our big gas tank or fuel tank for the shuttle. And that holds a million gallons of fuel that feed three engines down at the bottom or tail of the space shuttle there. We've got two other white rockets. They look like giant white pencils on either side. They're filled with solid propellant, like gunpowder. And they burn for the first two minutes of the flight, and then they separate and drop off. And there in the center, you see the space shuttle itself, about the size of a commercial airplane, flying into your local airport there. And it's only the tiny section in the nose where you see some of the little black dots there. That's our crew compartment, and that's the only area of the shuttle that's pressurized with oxygen for the astronauts to live and work in. And it's a fairly small area, maybe about the size of your kitchen at home. And that's where seven of us would spend two to two and a half weeks in space. So they bring us out here on launch morning. We take an elevator up on the left-hand side there of the picture. And then near the nose of the shuttle, there's a little walkway. We walk across that, and we crawl inside a round hatch in the side of the shuttle. OK, next. Here you see me in my launch suit. I've taken the elevator up. In the back room, you see Space Shuttle Columbia there. And I'm just waiting when it's my turn for them to strap me into my seat. They'll call my name. I'll turn that corner off to the left, walk down that access arm, and then the next picture will show you I'm standing at the hatch of the shuttle there. And before I would climb on board, we had two gentlemen there in the white suits that would help me put on a parachute harness. They'll check over all my equipment. And once we're ready to go, I get on my hands and knees there. And I just crawl inside that round hatch there and, and find my seat. And they strap us in with our seat belt and shoulder harnesses there. Once we're all strapped in, they close and seal that round hatch. And then everybody moves away from us, about five kilometers away from the launch pad. And they do that to get into a safe, a safe distance. If there should be an accident, an explosion during launch, they want to make sure everybody is safe. So they, they move everybody about five kilometers away from us. Once we're strapped inside, it's fairly quiet up until six seconds before liftoff, and that's when our main engines start coming up to full power. We're still physically bolted down to the launch pad at that point, and the computers are checking everything. Once they say their three engines look good, then we light our two white rockets there, our solid rocket boosters, and immediately we take off. And liftoff to me felt like somebody had their hand right in the middle of my back, just pushing me up into the sky. And that's what the shuttle's doing, literally pushing us, throwing us up in the air. This picture is taken uh, just four seconds after liftoff. We're going 200 kilometers an hour already. So we don't ease off the launch pad. It is literally boom, and we accelerate faster, 
and faster every second. Two minutes into the flight, we're uh, 40 kilometers up in the air, and at this point we're traveling at a speed of about 5,000 kilometers an hour already. And our two side rockets have used up their fuel. They separate off to the sides and will fall back to Earth. They have giant parachutes that would open, and these would land about 250 kilometers off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic Ocean. And NASA would have boats there. We'd recover these, bring them back to the Kennedy Space Center. We would clean them up, load them up with new fuel, and use them again on another mission. So at this point, we have our space shuttle right at the center of the picture. You'll see three white dots. Those are the three engines burning. And just to the right-hand side, you see a little fuzzy patch. That's our big fuel tank, and that's going to take us the rest of the way to space. Okay, next. Eight and a half minutes after liftoff, the engine shut down. Okay. Perfectly quiet for a second. Done. Then the big kaboom, we fire some explosive bolts, and the space shuttle separates from our big fuel tank. And this fuel tank would just fall back in the atmosphere and burn up like a shooting star. It's the only part of the shuttle we didn't reuse. Just use it the one time to get up there. We separate. It falls back. And that leaves us then, as you see here, with the space shuttle orbiting the Earth. It only takes eight and a half minutes to get to space. That was always amazing to me. I'll bet it takes some of our learners there today more than eight and a half minutes to get to school in the morning. And to think in eight and a half minutes, we're about 300 kilometers above the Earth. And at this point, we're traveling at a speed of about 27,000 kilometers an hour. That's about seven or eight kilometers a second. So we're really moving up there, and we go so fast that we can orbit the Earth in only an hour and a half. I could fly from Houston over to South Africa or Kenya in maybe 25 or 30 minutes or so. So we really are traveling fast up there. First thing you experience is zero gravity. You don't walk like we're used to doing here on Earth. When you want to move around, it's just a little push with your finger and you go sailing through the air like Superman or Superwoman. And uh, if you like doing somersaults, you can start flipping in the air. And you'll go round and round all day until you get tired and you grab a hold of something, reach out and stop yourself. So does it sound like fun up there? It's a blast being in space. And this picture you see here is Chaki Mukai. She was the first Japanese woman in space. And I flew with her in my first mission. She's just coming out of a tunnel into a little science laboratory we have there. In this picture, you see Susan Still, our pilot. And she's typing on a laptop computer there, like we do here on Earth. But I want to point out one thing. She's got her toes there hooked on that gold pole that you can see on the left-hand side of the picture. If you hook her toes onto that pole, every time she hit the piece of a computer, she would float up in the opposite direction. But if she just anchors her toes just a little bit, she can stay in one position and type away on the computer all day long. Very comfortable environment floating around up there in zero gravity. Okay, next. And in space, there's no up or down. You know, here on Earth, when you stand on your head, you know, the blood rushes to your head because of the pull of gravity. And you can feel the pressure inside your head from that. But that doesn't happen in space. And wherever your head is pointed, that direction is up for you in space. Wherever your feet are pointed, that's down. So in this picture, you see Nancy on the left and Kevin on the right from my second mission. And Nancy's looking at Kevin there and saying, hey, Kevin, you're upside down. Well, Kevin's looking right back at her and saying, no, you're upside down. In his little world there, she's the one that appears to be upside down. So again, wherever your head is pointed, your brain says that direction is up. You never feel like you're upside down. It's everybody else. In the world. Okay, next. And in space, we don't have a refrigerator, a freezer, microwave oven, nothing like that. So all of our food is freeze-dried. It comes in small plastic packages like I'm holding here. And when you want to prepare a meal, you bring your food over to this food station. There's a needle that pokes into the package, and you can inject hot water in there. And this dry, hard food will absorb that water. It'll soften up, and after two or three minutes, it's ready to eat. We would just cut this open with a pair of scissors and eat it with a normal fork or spoon. Now, all of our food packages have a little blue dot of Velcro. You can see them right there. 
And after we make our meal, we would just melt from the food to ourselves. Maybe you could see here. And we would just float to a window to watch the earth go by. You know, everything's got the Velcro. We can just anchor ourselves down there, uh, anchor it to ourselves or to the wall of the shuttle to keep it from floating away. Now, for drinking in space, we can't drink out of a normal glass or bottle like we're used to here on Earth. If I had a bottle of water up in space, I could take the top off and tip it upside down, and nothing would happen. Without gravity, that liquid doesn't fall or pour out of the bottle. So in space, we can't drink out of a glass and bottle, and instead we drink out of little foil pouches like I'm holding here. This one has powdered orange juice in it. We've got powdered lemonade, powdered coffee, powdered tea. And to prepare a drink, we bring it to that food station. There's a needle that'll poke inside there. We can inject the water. Then you just mix it up. You poke a straw in there, and you squeeze it into your mouth to drink. In this picture, you see I'm holding a bag like this. It's a bag of tropical punch. And maybe you can see the red straw there. And I've squeezed the bag of punch, and some of it got away from me. And what looks like a little red ball in front of my face is actually a punch. Any liquid in space will form a perfectly round sphere, and it'll just float there in front of you. You can go up to it and gobble it down in one bite. You can go up to it with a straw, poke it in there, and just drink that way. Or if I left that blob alone after a few minutes, hours, it would slowly evaporate and disappear, and that would be the end of it there. So that's how we drink up in space. Okay, next. Sleeping is a little different in space. We don't have dedicated bedrooms, so when it comes time to go to bed, we just take a sleeping bag and we attach it to the bed. A couple of clips there. And you see we have these dark shades on our eyes there. That's to keep the sunlight out. Because we go around the Earth every hour and a half, we get 45 minutes of daylight and 45 minutes of nighttime. And if you don't want the sun coming in your eyes all the time, you need to wear the eye shades that you see there. We've got the, another sleeping bag above them. It's like a double decker there. And most of the astronauts, at least one night, they'll put their sleeping bag up on the seat just so they can come back to Earth and tell their friends, you know, one night I slept up in the ceiling. Telling the truth, right? <laughs> Correct. Okay, for cleaning up in space, next picture. We don't have a bathtub. We don't have a shower. We don't even have a sink like you have in your kitchen or bathroom at home. So when it comes time to clean up, we've got some of these drink bags, and instead of having powdered juice in them, a few of these will have powdered soap. And what we do is add hot water. We can mix up a bag of hot soapy water. We squeeze it on a washcloth and we can give ourselves a sponge bath. That's how we clean up up in space. For washing our hair, we have a special shampoo that you see here called No Rinse Shampoo. And this stuff was developed for people who in the hospital that can't get out of bed. And it's very easy to use. doesn't require any water. All you do is squirt some of this in your hair, you make up a lather, and then you take a towel and pat it dry, and you're done. And I took this picture. I love the bottom line on the bottle there. It says, for beautifully clean, full-bodied hair. And the next picture will show you what that looks like in space. So anybody with longer hair, it floats all over up there. I'm not picking on Susan here. Even my short hair floats all over in space. And we say that every day is a bad hair day in space. OK, next picture. Now, exercise is really important in space. You know, here on Earth, we walk around all day. We're carrying objects. But in space, it's a little push with your finger, and you float through the air. And everything is weightless. I can lift your car with one finger in space. So we're not using our muscles at all. It's very important to exercise up there. So on the space shuttle, we had a little bicycle that we would ride every day for about 45 minutes. It would get your heart muscle going, get your leg muscles working. at the end of the day. In good okay, next. You guys know what this is? Okay. What is that? Some someone suggested a toilet. The toilet. That's uh, our toilet, our loo up on the the space shuttle, and it's in a little closet, maybe uh, you know a meter and a half across by two meters high has a curtain that goes across the front, like a shower curtain for privacy. 
And there in the center of the picture, you see the white toilet seat, very similar to our toilets here on Earth. But here on Earth, we use gravity to collect the waste material in a toilet. You can imagine what's going to happen in space. So this toilet is kind of like a port loo that you may see at a construction site or a sporting event. And in the bowl part of the toilet, we have giant fans. And to go to the bathroom, there's a little white knob on the, right of the, on the left hand side of the picture. We would push that knob forward. It would activate the fans, and it sucks air from the toilet seat downward. So we use this down washer here in the bowl part of the toilet to act like gravity to keep all the waste material there. There's a little clear funnel and a hose that it's attached to right by the toilet seat. That's connected to a vacuum. You pee into that hose, and it collects all the urine into a tank underneath the floor. And you see there's a couple places there to put your feet into to anchor yourself down so you're not floating all over when you're trying to go to the bathroom. Okay, next. And in space, it's a wonderful environment there. Everything floats up there. So if you're brushing your teeth and you finish up and you want to rinse out your mouth, you can just let go of your feet. Float across the get a drink of water, and then you come back, and your toothbrush and toothpaste should be floating in the air right where you let, let go of them there. Okay, next. I'll show you some pictures of the Earth now. And that's the favorite activity. Pictures of the Earth that's the picture. I love going to the window to watch the Earth go by. And here I have a map in my hand. I'm trying to figure out where we are around planet Earth. And I'm looking out one of the windows towards the tail end of the shuttle. And I took a camera right up to that window, and I took a picture so you can see exactly what my eyes are seeing as I look out that window. And the next picture will show you the view that I see from space, looking out the back of the shuttle. There. And there you see the beautiful blue Earth. All the blue in this picture is the Pacific Ocean. The white are puffy clouds. Those clouds are seven or eight kilometers above the Earth, and we're flying 300 kilometers up, so we're well above the atmosphere there. On the right-hand side of the picture, you may see Baja, California coming down. And on the far right-hand side, you'll see the west coast of the mainland of Mexico there. And if you look carefully, right along the limb of the Earth, you may see a little thin blue line right along the edge of the Earth there. And does anybody, can you guess what that might be? That's our atmosphere. And this Earth, when you look up at the blue sky, like I hope you have today, you, you know, it looks like our atmosphere goes on forever and ever. But from space, when you see our atmosphere edge on, it's a, a very thin layer. It's like paper thin. It's only about 30 kilometers thick. That's all that's protecting us here on planet Earth. Why would we flew here? major impact on our planet. Okay, next. In this picture, you see a giant hurricane or typhoon. And this one out over the Pacific Ocean. This was about 600 kilometers across. It passed right over the center of the storm, which is called the eye of the hurricane. And from 300 kilometers up, I can look out the window and look straight down into the eye and see the blue water of the Pacific Ocean. The next picture will show you what that eye looks like, looking straight into it from above there. The eye is about 25 or 30 kilometers across. You get really big winds in the center, but near the edge of that eye, it's called the eye wall, where we get the highest winds. This was a Category 3 hurricane. This one had winds of nearly 200 kilometers an hour. So huge, powerful hurricane. OK, next. This picture shows you a, a hurricane, uh, not a hurricane, I'm, I'm sorry, a volcano <laughs> down in the uh, South Pacific near in and you can see the volcano venting steam there. On the left-hand side, you'll see a volcanic crater half underwater there. At the top of the picture, these are all volcanic islands. These volcanoes start at the bottom of the ocean. They grow larger and larger until they poke through the surface like this one that's venting here is doing. And sometimes they grow into these big islands that people can live on, like the Hawaiian Islands and Japanese Islands. OK, next. In this picture, you see uh, the Himalaya Mountains. And right at the very center of the picture, uh, you see Mount Everest there. It's got a, almost a triangular shadow on the right-hand side. And that is Mount Everest. 
And I can you know sit here in front of you and tell you today, without lying, I have seen the top of Mount Everest with my own eyes about 25 times during my mission. I call it the lazy man's way to the top of Mount Everest, right? No climbing involved, just cruising overhead at uh, 27,000 miles kilometers an hour as I drink my juice. But I use this picture to illustrate some of the things I got to see and do during my career. I've never climbed on it in my life, but I've seen it time five times. I've seen the Great Barrier Reef off Australia. I've seen the Amazon rainforest in Brazil and South America. And I've seen Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa there poking up through the clouds. All these amazing sights I've been able to see on planet Earth. Okay. Sunrise from space. Because we do right now that you I can't hear you there, Steve, if I if I lost you. There's a slight delay there. Uh, uh, a couple of guests uh, um, that are one is Govind is actually from. You're very broken up here, Steve. I'm having a hard time hearing you. I see we got some people joined us, right? You said we have a couple of guests. And I cannot hear you here. Okay. That's cool. You just carry on, Don. <laughs> okay, I heard that part. <laughs> Did you want to say anything else? Okay. Up it in the chat for you. Okay. And I'm just waiting for the chat here. Okay. Yeah, we've got guests you said from Kenya and uh, Nepal. Welcome, everybody. Well, let's press on with the uh, presentation here. Here you see uh, a picture of a sunrise from space. And because we go around the Earth every hour and a half, we get to see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every 24-hour day up there. And they're all spectacular. They're all a little different. And again, the one impression you have of watching a sunrise from space is you see how thin our atmosphere is. From space, you see it only 30 kilometers thick. It really shows up as a, a tiny, thin band protecting us here on planet Earth. Okay, next. And those of you in Cape Town may recognize this beautiful part of the world. Here you see uh, in the next picture the southern coast of South Africa from space. And I'm waiting for that picture to advance, Steve. Yep. Mm. Can you see that? I have the picture of a sunrise. There we go. There you see South Africa. There's uh, the Cape coming down there. And advance it again to the next picture. Okay. If you look, zoom in a little bit more, you can actually see some of the ships and the port area there in Cape Town. And if you've got really good eyes, you can see the Cape Town Science Center there. Let's see the next picture if you can. But on a clear day, it's such a beautiful view to see uh, 
you know, the southern coast of South Africa here in Cape Town. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm I'm getting I'm not getting that slide advanced here on my end. There you go. And there you see the night view. This is Cape Town at nighttime. Just beautiful city lights that you see there. On the left-hand side, you see the port area right downtown. And then the next picture will show you a comparison of daytime and nighttime of the same region there. We call up the next picture. OK. At the end of the mission, it's time to come home. Okay. We would fire two engines in the back of the shuttle. We would slow our speed down from 27,000 kilometers an hour to about 28,000 or 26,000 kilometers an hour. And at that speed, it, it slows us down enough for gravity to take over, and we start falling back to Earth. And we fire those engines halfway around the world, out over the Indian Ocean, and the shuttle would begin to fall as we cross the Pacific. It would fall as we cross the United States. And the next picture will show you we land like an airplane right back in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center there. We touch down like an airplane. And then we deploy a big parachute out the back of the space shuttle there that helps us slow down. And then we just put the brakes on and we roll to a stop at the end of the runway there. And we wait for them to come and open the hatch. It takes them about one hour before they open the hatch and we can get outside. And when you first come back from space, you feel like you weigh about uh, 1,000 kilograms. You, know, you feel so heavy coming back to the gravity of Earth here after two weeks of floating around. But it's always an exciting moment. I always had a big smile on my face. I was always glad to be back to Earth. You know, being up in space is, is spectacular. It's a great experience. But I really prefer living on Earth here. This is where my friends are. This is where my family is, my favorite restaurants. So this is where you really want to spend your life down on Earth, but space is beautiful. In this picture here, you see me on the left-hand side. Uh, this is just maybe an hour and a half after we landed from my very first mission on Space Shuttle Columbia. And after we took this picture, I turned around, and I saw the name Columbia there. And I thought, wow, what an amazing vehicle. This was my house in space for two weeks. This thing protected me from the fiery reentry coming through the atmosphere. And uh, one of the next thoughts that popped into my head was, I got to do this again. And it was like going on a fun roller coaster if you've ever been out at a theme park and been on a fun, you know, thrilling roller coaster. Uh, that's the way this was. You know, as soon as I got off, I wanted to run around, get back in line, and do it again. And as I mentioned earlier, I had the opportunity to fly on four space shuttle missions. So it was really an incredible opportunity to go in space. So, Steve, with that, why don't we pause and see if any of our friends there have any questions they'd like to ask this morning or afternoon. Okay. Um, we, we've got us seven seconds, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, we had Peyton from Mrs. Gates class in Pennsylvania, and she wanted to know... I missed the question there. I, Peyton in Pennsylvania has a question here. Is it possible to see the third pole? I'm not sure what the third pole is there. You know, we don't fly up near the north or south pole. I'm trying to get your question here. Oh, Mount Everest. You can see uh, Mount Everest clearly from space. We're 300 kilometers up, 200 miles Back away. again? Go ahead, Steve. But I think it was Peyton from Mrs. Gates' class. She wanted to know, uh, have you ever worn a space suit? So did you ever do a space walk? 
Okay, I just got the question. Yeah, I've never done a spacewalk on my four missions. I was trained to go outside. If there was a problem out there, I would have been one of the two astronauts to go out there, but never got to go on any of my missions outside to do that. We would only do that if there was a planned spacewalk. Maybe we repair a satellite or we're building, doing some work on the International Space Station. Then we would go outside. I always wanted to do that. I thought it would be so cool just to look at the Earth through a little visor on the screen. But now, what happens if you need to sneeze? If you sneeze, you're going to sneeze inside your helmet there, and it's going to make a big mess. So you work really hard at nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and if your nose itches, there's nothing you can do. You just okay. have six or seven hours. OK. Uh, you come, come stand over here. OK, we have a question from a young space explorer. Come over here. Come, come, come. Don't be shy. You can come and ask the question. What, we, what do you want to know? Um, what, um, did you want to know if you had... have you been to the moon? Let's see what he's... Oh, that's a great question. No, I have not been to the moon. I was in uh, high school, you know, I was maybe 14, 15 years old when Neil Armstrong first stepped on the moon. And only 12 people have been to the moon, and that was about 40 to 45 years ago. So I was too young to go to the moon, and now I'm too old to go to the moon. But you are the perfect age to go to the moon. We should start sending astronauts back to the moon in 10, 15 years in that time frame. You may have the opportunity to go to the moon in your lifetime. You may also have the opportunity to go to the planet Mars. About 30 to 40 years from now, we hope to send astronauts to the planet Mars. And you are the perfect age, it looks like, to be one of those astronauts in the future. I'm way too old to go to Mars. You know, in 30 years, I'll be like 90 years old. I'm too old to go to Mars, but you're the perfect age there. That is so cool. But now, Don, I have an interesting question for you. One of your missions was called, there was a little bit of drama and about that. Yeah, on my second mission, we were just getting ready to launch on Space Shuttle Discovery one week before launch. And the woodpecker came in and attacked our space shuttle. Our big orange fuel tank looks a little bit like a tree to a woodpecker. So this one woodpecker came in and made holes in that big fuel tank. And he made 200 holes in that big fuel tank. And it delayed our mission by a month because NASA had to stop everything and patch up the big fuel tank that allowed us, allowed us to go on. So we became known as the woodpecker flight. And Steve, I got a frozen picture. Here we go. Did your badge have a woodpecker on it? We, uh, we had an unofficial badge with the woodpecker on it, but not the ones we flew. Somebody at NASA made up a, our name, our badge, like you see here for the flight. We had one with the little woodpecker that they put on there, but we didn't actually fly those, but that's my favorite one. <laughs> I can imagine. Question? Did you admit that you couldn't... You know, I'll tell you this quick story. On, on my first mission, my first day in space, I'm looking out the window. The sky is pitch black. And uh, I see a light flashing out there. And it's flashing once a second. And it catches my attention. And I keep watching this. And I notice that it's moving with the shuttle. I see city lights down below. But this object that's flashing is moving with us. So at first, I'm thinking. I'm making contact. Maybe it's a, an alien, a spacecraft there. And I kept watching it, and I didn't know what it was. But after about five minutes, I realized that I was looking at a big chunk of ice that had come off our space shuttle after launch. And this ice was just turning around in the air like that. It had a flat side to it. And when the sunlight would hit it, it would give you a flash, like a, a light hitting a mirror. 
And so what I thought might be an alien turned out to be a chunk of ice. So we see a lot of strange things up there. Most of them, if you take the time, you can explain them away. So I didn't see anything up there that was really unusual that I could not explain away. But we do see some strange lights, things like that from time to time. Question? I did not. I did not. Repeat it. Oh, okay. I'll, um, if you read in the chats, Chris uh, from Mrs. Gates' class in Pennsylvania wants to know the names of the space shuttles that you flew on. Okay. I was on Space Shuttle Columbia three times and then Space Shuttle Discovery one. And then um, Addy from Mrs. Flynn's class would like to know, is it warm or is it cold in space? That's a great, great question. It's both, both warm and cold. As we orbit the Earth, we go around it, I told you, in an hour and a half. We get 45 minutes of the time you're in sunlight, 45 minutes you're in darkness. And outside the shuttle in the sunlight, it's very, very hot. It's uh, over 100 degrees centigrade. And then at nighttime, when the sun goes down, it gets very cold, like minus 75 degrees, minus 100 centigrade as well. So we've got incredible temperature extremes as we orbit the Earth. If you're outside doing a spacewalk, you, you would experience those temperature changes. And that's why the spacesuit has to protect you from that. Inside the shuttle, though, we're insulated there. And it's like being in your house in the summer or the wintertime. We keep it a comfortable temperature even though it could be warm or very cold outside. Hey, all right to know. Um, what was it like in space? What was it like in space? You know, yeah, being in space and zero gravity, it feels a lot like if you jump in a swimming pool or jump in the ocean there and you get the weight off your body and you're kind of floating in the water there. Here on Earth, we've got the pull of gravity pulling down on us. It's hard to lift your arms up. They're heavy. But in space, everything is weightless up there. And it just takes a little push with your finger and you go sailing through the air like Superman or Superwoman. You can do incredible gymnastics, somersaults in the air there. But the closest thing to being in space here on Earth is being in a swimming pool, just to get the weight off your body. Hmm. We have another question for you. Mother. Yep. Do you, sorry, uh, the mother, doctor mother here. Do, do you um, have much mass, muscle mass loss when you come back? Because though you're exercising, you're not doing... Yeah, that's a really good... In the degree of exercise that you would have done on... Uh... Really good question. We do, because we're not using our muscles up there, they, they, they grow smaller very quickly up there. It's very similar if you're in the hospital for two weeks, your muscles atrophy, and it's difficult to get up and walk out of bed again. It's like that in space. So we exercise an hour a day up there, but that is still not sufficient. We lose our muscle strength. We lose our bone density as well. Our bones, come when we come back, are weaker. Uh, for our astronauts up on the International Space Station, they live up there for six months at a time, and exercise is even more important for them. They exercise two to three hours every day up there. But even with that amount of exercise, they still come back with weakened muscles and weakened bones. So we're still working at NASA to try to figure out how can we keep our astronauts healthy up there because in the future we're going to send some of our young students, our young learners to Mars and other destinations and they may be away from Earth for two to three years. We want to make sure they're healthy and in good shape when they come back to Earth at the end of the mission. <coughs> so we're really doing a lot of research on board the space station. 
Okay. Thank you. And then, and then uh, from Govinda, his daughter, Swachalika, uh, she wants to know uh, uh, space. How would you communicate in space? Okay, if, if you're outside the space shuttle, uh, in the vacuum of space, there's no way you can talk because we need air to transmit our voice. So two astronauts in a vacuum there in space, they have to use a radio headset. And they would have like, a, I'm wearing a headset here today and I have a little speaker, a microphone here that I can speak and you can hear me. And that's how we would do it in space. Underneath our space suit, we've got microphones. We can talk so that the other astronauts, the uh, people in mission control can hear us as well. Inside the shuttle, it's pressurized with oxygen. It's just like being here on Earth. So we can talk back and forth, and, and you can hear each other just like you do here on Earth. Okay, okay. Any other questions? We're just going to give them a chance to ask a question. Sure. We've, we've had a, a couple of questions on on the internet. The, the, the one obviously is, uh, you, you've kind of answered about have you seen anything that you can't explain. Uh, one was, was alluding to the fact that have you seen any aliens, but uh, you have explained that to us. The, the other question that was online, which was very interesting, was um, settling and Elon Musk, the South African, South African has, has decided he wants to put a... What is your, your view on that? You know, go, go to the very last slide. If you can advance to that, Steve. I've got a picture of Mars there. Okay, if that. you can't do that, that's okay. You know, we plan, plan. We hope to send human beings to the surface of Mars. You know, in 30 to 40 years is the time frame. At NASA today, we're building some new rockets, big heavy lifters that can carry super payloads. So hopefully, 30 years from now, we'll be able to send astronauts to the asteroids to the surface of Mars. And this is a picture of one of those first flights. You see our landing craft there. And our two small, you know, figures there to the right-hand side are the first two humans to set foot on Mars. So we're hoping in the 30 to 40-year time frame to, to send humans there. Maybe they stay there for about two years. That's the initial plan. Uh, you want to launch when Earth and Mars are close together. And you have to wait a couple of years uh, for Mars, Earth and Mars to get, you know, close again to return back to Earth. Um, so it'll be a long, maybe two years to go to Mars. It'll be a while before we send a million people to Mars. Mars has a very thin atmosphere. And it's almost very little oxygen, mainly carbon dioxide. So Mars it, it's not a very habitable planet. It doesn't have much water. It used to billions of years ago, but today it's a very dry planet. We've got ice underneath the surface, but uh, you know, on the surface, not much water there that we can use. So it'd be very difficult to send a lot of people there right now. There's no plants, no animals, no water, no oxygen. So we need to carry all of that with us there. And again, hopefully we can we can use some of the ice underneath the surface there to get water. From that water, we can split it into hydrogen and oxygen. So we got oxygen to breathe. But we're we're you know maybe a century away from from having a, a lunar base with with uh, hundreds or thousands of people living there, you know, on Mars. Sure. Okay. And then the one question I wanted to know is that, uh, you know, if, if you were going to travel to distant planets, um, humans only live for so long. How are we going to get over that aspect of it? Yeah, it's a really good question as well. You know, uh, if we would travel today to the nearest star, it would take a thousand years for us to get there with our current, you know, propulsion rocket engines. So you either need a, a brand new system of propulsion that'll get you there quicker, or maybe you launch a group of people and they don't make it t to the nearest star, but maybe their children's 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 children you know, generations down in, in the future would actually make it to the to the other star system there. So 
It's very difficult today for us to travel to another star. If we found a planet that was just like Earth, it could take multi-generations for, for the humans to make it there um, because it would just take so long to transit. That's why we need a lot of new scientists and engineers, our young learners there, that can help us develop maybe some of these new technologies we can use so that we can shorten the time to get from one star to another. Iman would like to know, do you use GPS or star sightings? Or is it all handled from the people on the ground? Or does audio instrumentation manage according to satellite communication? How do you, you work out your positioning when, when you are in space? Yeah, we have uh, we use our positioning. We use the stars to do alignments, and we've got uh, you know gyroscopes on board, navigation units, so we know exactly where we are in space. We know where we are we are in relationship to the Earth, so we always have that information. We get updates from Mission Control down on the ground. They'll help uh, watch over. You know, to make sure our computers are accurate and, and that where they think we are is, is really where we are. When it comes time to come back to Earth, we do use other navigation systems. We use like a GPS and other navigation to help us get down to the runway for our landing, just like uh, some of our commercial airplanes do as well. We've got some of the best navigation for you know, traveling in space. I can imagine. Um, what what is your, your view on the shuttle and going back to rockets? Yeah, it was a little sad for me to see them retire the space shuttle. I wanted them to fly forever. Clearly they couldn't do that, but uh, they decided to retire them and they're going back to smaller capsules like we did during the Apollo program. So we're working on a new capsule. It's called Orion. It'll hold from two to, to six astronauts. And with these capsules, we'll be able to go, you know, with these bigger rockets onto the moon, to asteroids, and then hopefully in the future onto Mars. The capsule design is just inherently safer than the shuttle. The shuttle was very fragile. It's covered with these tiles on the outside that if a piece of ice or a piece of debris hits them, it could damage the shuttle tiles and, and, and cause you to overheat or burn up when you're coming back through the atmosphere. So it was a little fragile, and where the astronauts sit on board the shuttle, you know, I have our model right here. Our astronauts are only sitting maybe just a few meters from our big fuel tank there. And if sh something should explode, then the astronauts are going to be lost. But on our new rockets, they'll be similar to what I'm holding here, and at the very top of it will be the capsule. And if the rocket should be blowing up, we'll be able to take that capsule and pull it free of the exploding rocket. So it'll just be inherently safer for the astronauts, which is one of the big reasons they're going back to that design that we've used in the past. Wow. Okay, we have a question about Pluto. What do you want to know about Pluto? Is it a star or a planet? Is Pluto a star or a planet? Or is it even a planet to begin with? Yeah, you know, it used to be a planet. When I was your age, Pluto was a planet. And about 10 years ago or so, some of the astronomers got together and they reclassified some of the planets. Pluto is very similar to a giant asteroid. So they, they thought it's not really a full planet on its own right. They, they classify it now as a subplanet. Pluto hasn't changed at all. Pluto is the same. It's only their definition how they classified it as a planet. So in my mind, I like to still think of it as a planet because that's where I learned it as a young boy. But for the scientists today, they call it a minor planet or subplanet. I mean, yeah, so clearly, clearly not a star. And the, the, the interesting thing about space travel at the moment is that if you look at the amount of profit, that is growing at an exponential rate. Right. Uh, that in people would be able to just buy a ticket at the airport to spend an hour or two in space? It won't be five or ten years. It'll be more like one to two years when, when you're able to do that. 
Richard Branson uh, from the UK with the uh, he had Virgin Airlines. He's got Virgin Galactic. Uh, he's developed a a carrier kind of airplane and a little mini space shuttle rocket plane. And just in a short year or so, one to two years, he'll be starting to launch from New Mexico in the western United States. And it'll be about a two-hour trip. And most of that two hours, you're spent circling to, to get maybe you know, uh, 12 kilometers above the Earth. And then you'll drop your rocket ship from the, from the bottom of this airplane, and you'll zoom up to about 120 kilometers. And you'll spend five minutes in zero gravity, and then you'll come back down and land. So the whole trip is about two hours. Most of that is getting up to your initial launch point, and you'll spend five minutes in zero gravity. You'll see the curvature of the Earth, the black sky. You'll be able to float around up there for five minutes. And the current price for that is about uh, 200000 U.S. dollars, so it's, it's quite expensive. Uh, but the price is coming down. Very. And I would guess in... 10, 15 years or so that the price would come down in the maybe the 10,000 US dollar range, which would be more in line with like maybe an exotic uh, vacation down to Antarctica that some people do. So the price is coming down and hopefully it gets down lower and lower. I would like to see everybody go up into space. Everybody listening should, should have the opportunity to see what I got to see of our planet because it would change you and change how you view our Earth and you would realize we have to take better care of our planet. Wow, that is very cool. Well, it, I, yes, I know you guys are going to go. Um, unfortunately, we <laughs> thank you. We we, we lost our, our our main group who was supposed to come here. There was a, a science show and and the science center closing. But uh, fortunately, we had our international guests who managed to join us and. And the people that were watching it live on YouTube as well, we thank you so much for joining us. And of course, to for giving on uh, this engineering. And, uh, you know, for, for us as, as South Africans, you know, we, we're very proud of the fact that, you know, we, we have uh, Elon Musk with SpaceX. Uh, we had Mark Shuttleworth, who was our first. Um, Afri African in space, South African in space, and then we're going to have our first African going into space quite soon as well. So he's quite excited about that. So I think that, um, and, our, and right now it's the International Astronautical Congress, which is taking place in Canada. And uh, it was nice to see some of the photographs agency. But it looks like China have popped up all of a sudden, and India have popped up all of a sudden, where I think that that smaller countries are all of a sudden going to be launching their own space program to change the, the, the so-called playing fields. I think that uh, international collaboration is, is going to make a huge difference. But, you know, Steve, right now the International Space Station has 16 countries that are involved with that. It is not just the United States or, or Russia. We've got 16 countries participating on it. And that has been a good model for what I hope we do in the future. When we send humans to the planet Mars, they should represent all of planet Earth. They shouldn't just be Americans or Russians or Chinese. They should be Earthlings that we send there to the planet. And I think that all nations should be participating and have a chance to participate in our, our space exploration in the future. And I'm very confident that that will happen. So. For our South African students and Kenya students and all over our planet, I hope there's opportunities for all of you to go into space one day and to participate. So to thank you so much for, for giving up your time. And we, we hope to connect with you again. And if you are interested, uh, Don has written a fascinating book about his travels in space and about the whole adventure involving the woodpecker and I will post all the links on our website as well. It's a uh, we just want to say thank you so much for your time and we say thank you to all our guests who came to join us. Thanks and happy Space Week to everybody. <laughs>